um, today we're talking about um, the book Music in Exile. And um, we are talking, or Exile Music, sorry, Exile Music. And we're um, talking about it with the author, Jennifer Style. So I'm going to introduce Jennifer. Um, Jennifer Style is an award winning novelist and memoirist who lives in many countries. She left the United States in 2006 to take a job as editor of a newspaper in Sana'a, Yemen, where she lived for four years. Her first book, The Woman Who Fell from the Sky, was inspired by her experience there. She began writing her first novel, The Ambassador's Wife, after she was kidnapped when pregnant with her daughter, an experience that became the first scene of that novel. She and her infant daughter were evacuated from Yemen after her husband, Tim Torlo, a British diplomat, was attacked by a suicide bomber. They lived in Amman, Jordan, till his posting ended, and he could join them in London. In 2012, they moved to La Paz, Bolivia, and early in her time there, Style met Jewish Bolivians whose families had fled the Nazis in Europe during World War II, and it's these stories that sparked her third novel, Exile music. <clears throat> the Ambassador's Wife won the William Faulkner William Wisdom Creative Writing Competition Best Novel Award and the 2016 Philip McMath Post Publication Book Award. Style's stories and articles have appeared in a number of publications besides New Orleans Review, Saranac Review, World Policy Journal, The Week, Time, Life, Washington Times, New York Post, just to name a few. Um, so, Jennifer, I wanted to welcome you today. Thank you for being with us. And um, we are going to um, first have Jennifer talk a little bit um, about her creation of the book uh, for maybe like five, ten minutes. And when Jennifer is done with that, she'll let me know. And we'll turn the recording off. And then we'll begin our discussion. So, Jennifer, you can um, go ahead. Thank you, Michael. I am so honored to be here talking with you today, and I'm delighted to have been invited by the Leo Beck Institute to talk with you all about Exile Music, which is very close to my heart. Um, I thought that it might be useful if I talked to you first about how I came to the idea of this book. As Michael just mentioned, I moved to Bolivia with my family in 2012. At the time, my husband, who is British, was working for the EU back in the halcyon days when the UK was part of the EU. And we, so we were living in La Paz, Bolivia, and we had, none of us had been there before. And very early on in our time there, my husband came home from work one day and said, did you know there are some 20,000 Jewish refugees living here during and after World War II? And I hadn't known that. I'd read a lot about the Jewish diaspora in other parts of South America, but I hadn't read anything specifically about Bolivia. And I, I became very interested in finding out more about this. And not that long late, about a couple of weeks later, I just happened to meet a man named John Galanter, um, who is the honorary Finnish consul, but whose mother fled Poland. Um, after her daughter and her parents were murdered by the Ukrainians and the Germans during the war. And his mother and father escaped to Bolivia and John was born there and grew up there. And so he began talking to me about his family's experiences, um, which he actually hadn't known his mother's history and everything that she'd endured hiding from the Nazis in this town. That was, it was part of Poland, then part of the Ukraine, then part of uh, the USSR, and then part of Ukraine, I think right now. So it's, it's one of those little corners that's been part of many countries. Um, and his, his mother's testimony is archived in a Holocaust museum in Israel and John was unaware of everything that had happened to her until he started reading that, um, which he sent me. Uh, and it's he was unable to get through reading it all because it's pretty tough reading, um, but it was incredibly useful to me for, for learning the research of his particular family before they came. Um, John introduced me to a man named Guillermo Wiener, who at one time had been Wilhelm Wiener, 
And when he was eight years old, he and his family escaped the Nazis. In, he was from Vienna, and he and his family escaped the Nazis, coming first to Argentina and then to Bolivia. And he grew up in La Paz, and he learned Spanish from his landlady's children, which is how I got the idea for my main character to learn Spanish from her landlady's children and how she becomes friends with Miguel in Exile Music. And I spent a lot of time talking with Guillermo about his experiences growing up in Bolivia as a refugee. Um, he said he was embraced uh, by the Bolivians and he assimilated quite easily and made a lot of Bolivian friends and he lived there his entire life at some point Austria invited him back and he said I am never going back to Austria there is nothing on earth that could make me agree to go back to Austria knowing what they've done to the Jews and you know when I interviewed him first he was 83 years old and still reading books about the Holocaust trying to understand how it happened because um, he still couldn't come to grips with what had what had, what had happened um, because it makes no sense and so he was fascinating to interview and gave me all sorts of details about what it was like growing up in La Paz and what it was like back then compared to when I lived in La Paz. Um, and so he I became very interested in the experiences of these refugees, because I thought, what must it have been like to come from a place like Vienna, where these people all had professions and, and lives and families, and to have lost everything, to have lost everyone they loved, to have lost their money, to have lost children, parents, uh, their professions, their homes, and to end up in the middle of the Andes in a place where they didn't speak the language, they didn't understand the cultures. Um, and how did they adjust to that? you know, what What did they do to adjust to, to life in La Paz, Bolivia? How did they manage living at 12,000 feet of altitude? Um, did they integrate with Bolivians or did they largely stick to, you know, their own refugee community because they found safety there, um, which was largely the case? Um, and then also, did they stay there after the war? Um, and so I became very interested in their experiences. But when I looked around for books about this population, there were not very many. There were a handful of memoirs. There's a beautiful memoir by Leo Spitzer called Hotel Bolivia. Leo uh, grew up in La Paz until he was 10 years old after having fled from Vienna. And he wrote a beautiful memoir about that time. And I also was able to interview him about his time in Bolivia. And he's the one who told me about the games he'd play as a child. Um, what kinds of games he played at school, things, little details for my story. Um, and so when I first thought all this is, you know, deserves to have more attention paid to it. I want people to know this story. And I thought, well, do I write a nonfiction book, a journalistic book about this part of the diaspora that's been overlooked? And I thought so many of the people who lived in Bolivia, so many of the survivors were dead that I wasn't sure I could get enough details about their individual stories to create a compelling narrative. And I thought, actually, if I if I did research to create um, as accurate a context as possible for the world in which these refugees lived, that I could create a fictional family and then I could include all these details in the in that narrative and with fiction you you're more able to create um a complete narrative that can can move a reader in a way that i didn't think i'd be able to do with nonfiction, giving given how sparse the material was and and uh, i see someone holding the book <laughs> um so I thought, you know, I want to work on this book. I was still writing another book at the time. So it wasn't until we lived in Bolivia for four years. And so I got to know the country pretty well. I traveled extensively. Um, I interviewed a lot of people there. I loved Bolivia. I learned Spanish. It was um, a really wonderful and rich time that we had there. Um, and I wasn't able to start working on this book until 
my very last year in Bolivia until I'd finished my previous novel. And then uh, we were back in London and I traveled to Vienna uh, to do some research for that part of the book because I wanted to, you know, while I, I was really anxious to get to the Bolivia part of the book because that's the part that hasn't been written about very much and some really fantastic authors have done a pretty amazing job of writing about the Austria part of the story, but I had to include that so that you knew where my characters were and what their lives were like before they ended up in La Paz. And there were some things I, I needed to include. So I went to Vienna so that I could figure out where exactly my characters lived, you know, the address that Orly, my protagonist Orly and her family lived at. I, I went to the Music Verein and the Vienna Philharmonic and the opera and investigated all these places, um, investigated the opera files so I could get opera dates right. Um, and then went to Genoa because it was really important to me that Genoa was where the ship left um, for South America for my family and my book, where a lot of the ships left for South America from Genoa and many other ports as well, but that was one of them. And I just wanted to see what my characters saw when they looked back on Europe for the last time, not just my characters, but actual real people. You know, what was it like to look back at Europe knowing it's probably the last time you're going to see it? Um, and so I went to Genoa and got on a boat and went out and, and looked back. Um, so, so that's kind of how I began, think, you know, gathering things for this book. And when I started thinking about whose story I wanted this to be, um, I started thinking about a little girl because Guillermo was eight years old when he came from Austria to Bolivia. And I felt that a child would be more, most able to adapt, you know, to learn the language like a native, to, to assimilate into the culture and um, to explore the country. Um, and I wanted to, to be able to do that through a younger person's eyes. Um, and at the same time, my daughter was around three or four um, during our first year or two in Bolivia. And one morning I was making breakfast in the kitchen and she came in and she said, where did we live before Bolivia? And I said, we lived in London. And she said, where did we live before London? And I said, we lived in Jordan. And she said, before that? And I said, Yemen. And she said, no, before Yemen, where did I live? And I said, well, you lived in my tummy. And she said, no, I want to know where I lived before I lived in your tummy. And I said, you didn't, you didn't exist. And she said, I existed. I, I existed, I existed in a place called Bunny Belts. And it is a land that is entirely vegetarian and it's run by the queen bunny. And um, they have little cars that are powered by Japanese fans. And she went on and on to create this very elaborate world that she continued to build for the next five years. And as she was telling me this story, I thought, if I were a child growing up in the 1930s in Austria with menace increasing all around me and the grownups talking about very scary things, I would need an imaginary world to retreat into. And so I thought that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with this girl creating this imaginary world to escape kind of what's going on. And then I thought it would be more interesting if she were doing it with someone because creating an imaginary world by yourself isn't as much fun. And so that's how I brought in Annalisa, her friend. And that's how I began the book. Please like this video and subscribe for more content from the Leo Beck Institute.